Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our research colloquium of April 2021. Today, we invite two presenters to share about their recent studies. First of all, let's welcome Mr. Tan Yixun from Department of Civil Engineering. He would like to share about trend analysis of seasonal rainfall patterns in Peninsular Malaysia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Tan Yixun. As introduced by Kun Meng, I'm currently a postgraduate student from the Department of Civil Engineering. For my presentation today, my title is on the trend analysis of seasonal rainfall patterns in Peninsular Malaysia, which was a paper submitted to the Engineering Conference of Ulimas. So what is this topic about? Long records of rainfall data with good quality is a significant component that triggers the entire change of responses in the hydrological cycle by providing useful information to hydrologists and related parties. Rainfall is a key element in the hydrological cycle, which is known to be the endless and repetitive movement of water flow. However, climate change caused the rainfall to fluctuate both spatially and temporally. Among the popular methods to explore the spatial and temporal trends of rainfall includes candle rain correlation, man candle, Spearman's rule, sand slope estimator, and many more. But why do we need to analyze the spatial and temporal trends of rainfall? This is important to ensure sufficient allocation of water supply for the development of sustainable water resources to reduce the exposure towards the risk of natural disasters such as flood and drought since these two disasters are highly correlated to rainfall. And lastly, to understand the impact of climate change on different sectors such as the agricultural, social, economic, and even other sectors. Let's take a look at the current situation in Peninsular Malaysia due to the direct impacts of rainfall variability. In 2014, Kuala Krai, a district in Kota Baru, encountered severe flooding. On the contrary, Selangor experienced the dry spell. We can clearly see that the Sungai Selangor Dam experiences a very critical water level. Therefore, extreme or lack in rainfall had caused extensive losses, especially in the agricultural and economic sectors. Much, the objectives are developed in this study, which is to evaluate the temporal trend and the magnitude of the seasonal rainfall patterns in Peninsular Malaysia. Since the study is located in Peninsular Malaysia, we need to understand the geographic characteristics of this country as well as its climate. Peninsular Malaysia is a tropical country which experiences hot and humid weather. The temperature is uniform and receives the amount of high rainfall throughout the year. The weather is also influenced by two major monsoon seasons. Firstly, the southwest monsoon, which occurs from May to September than the Northeast Monsoon, which happens from October to March. In this study, daily rainfall data set for eight stations with a minimum historical period of 25 years were used and shown as seen in the table here. Moving on, it is regarding the methodology adopted in this study. There are four homogeneity tests applied, namely Bouchard range, Petit test, standard normal homogeneity test and von Neumann ratio. The homogeneity tests are applied to ensure that the measurements are recorded under the same environmental conditions using the same measurement technique. As for the trend analysis, MK test is applied to test or to identify the positive or negative trend present in the daily rainfall data set. While for the sand slope estimator, it will indicate whether the trend is significant based on its magnitude. In the following part, we have the equations for all four homogeneity tests shown here. And subsequently, we have the equation shown for the trend test. So moving on, coming to the findings of the study, the results of the homogeneity test we found that Hospital Seremban rejected all four tests for inter-monsoon 1 and southwest monsoon rainfall. As you can see on the table, the p-value for the four tests 
are lesser than 0 0.05. Therefore, we can say that this station is deemed to be inhomogeneous. As you can see in the figure, a break occurred at 1998 and later at 2012. Similar results were also seen at KLIA Sepang for the southwest monsoon season. And in contrast to that, the Bayan Lepas rainfall is homogeneous for all four seasons. Based on the earlier results, we can further classify the seasonal rainfall data based on the homogeneity test into three. Class 1, useful when less than one test is rejected, class two, doubtful, when two tests are rejected, and class three, suspect, when more than two tests are rejected. The table here shows the percentage of the rainfall stations classified into their classes and based on each rainfall seasons. As for the trend analysis part, in the results, we found that the Bayan La Paz showed an increasing trend based on the Z value for the northeast monsoon rainfall. The trend is identified to be significant since the p value here is lesser than 0 0.05 and the sand slope estimator showed a larger value as compared to Batu Pahat. Similar findings were also identified at Hospital Seremban, Ipoh, KLIA Sepang, which has a large sand slope value when the p value is less than 0 0.05. With such indicators from the trend analysis, it is a sign that tells us that these locations may experience high rainfall amount during the northeast monsoon season. Coming to the end, the following conclusion can be drawn. Overall, an increasing trend of seasonal rainfall was observed at most of the stations. These results are able to provide pertinent guidance in the preparation for the repercussions of natural catastrophes. So this is an indication that at which season and at which location we may experience high rainfall amount, which could probably lead to flooding or low rainfall amount, which that could lead to possible drought. Future recommendations in this study may include coverage of more rainfall stations at each state to obtain a more accurate results. In the current study, there are mostly only one station for each state. If a state is very large in area, therefore the accuracy of this trend analysis may not be as accurate to provide the whole coverage towards that state itself. Besides that, identification of appropriate methods to improve the quality of rainfall data under the class of doubtful, as you can see from the classification of the rainfall data, there are a portion of significant percentage that are being classified as doubtful. If we could make use of this data with appropriate measures, then it could reflect back to this accuracy by including the coverage of more rainfall stations. So that is all for my presentation. Should you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Thanks, Mr. Tan. Any question from the audience, please? So if no question, then uh, I think we proceed with our second presenter. So let's welcome Dr. Taki Adin Sigir from uh, School of Architecture and Built Environment. He would like to share about a BIM-based method for building energy intensified evaluation. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My uh, paper is entitled A BIM-based method for building energy intensity BI evaluation. Actually, I, I did or presented this paper already in the International Civil Engineering and Architecture Conference 2021 in Singapore. And this work has been done by me and my co-author from University of UTM, Limia Kwa. By the way, I'm a lecturer in the uh, School of uh, Architecture. So actually, if you are not aware about BIM, so BIM is Building Information Modeling. And my area of research focused on the application of Building Information Modeling in assessing or evaluating the greenness of green building in terms of energy consumptions uh, and uh, material resources used, etc. Now, to get a better idea about the background of the study, now, we, as you can see, we have a typical building design. Generally, the architect, there is three main things, things they will think about. 
So the design itself, design parameters, and the cost of any decision that we take, and the time to deliver the project. So these are the most important things. However, when the concept of sustainability and the green buildings has come to the industry, many criteria, as you can see, related to sustainability, we have to assess them. Things regarding energy efficiency, how much your building will consume energy, things regarding uh, uh, indoor air, uh, air quality, things regarding uh, the use of materials, and all these that are related to parameters, and many of them that are, we can quantify them. And based on that, of course, the, the work of the architect will not be an easy task because too many variables, too many things we have to, 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 to take care of. So things, they have become really complicated when it comes to decision making, which decision that we can take to make the uh, outcomes of the green building more uh, efficient in terms of energy, for example. So that's why in, the, in this area, many scholars that are trying to integrate BIM, Building Information Modeling, to this process, to facilitate this process. And this is what we are doing in this uh, work. However, in this work, we are focusing only in, on uh, one criteria, which is uh, BI, Building Energy Intensity. So it's important to know that buildings consume a total of about 50% of electricity generated in the country. And BEI is adopted, which is building energy intensity, has been adopted uh, by um, Malaysia as a metric to measure the and compare the energy consumption of buildings. Now, in order to assess the BEI, there is two main methods: either use dynamic simulation engine like Energy Plus, or the other uh, option is using uh, an Excel-based tool called BIT. This tool is available in Malaysia and it follows a static model for the calculation of energy uh, intensity. Now this, now this BIT tool was de developed by the Association of Consulting Engineers in Malaysia in 2010 uh, to evaluate building energy consumption. And in the same time, as I mentioned, uh, actually building information modeling actually Many countries that are trying to do their best to adopt it, and including Malaysia, though, because it has too many uh, benef uh, benef uh, advantages. So, if you are not aware, so it's uh, a process based on the use of an intelligent data rich model to support this de design decision making throughout the building life cycle. Now, the problem statement regarding this paper, actually, when we reviewed this, the tool that I told you about, which is the BIT, the static tool, which is here, we found too many limitations. So if you are an architect and you're trying to calculate how, many, how much energy will be consumed by your building, if you use this tool, you will find it contains too many limitations. First of all, this tool supports only building envelopes with maximum four elevations and only one material or window type per elevation. This means if your building contains, let's say, five elevations or five facades, so basically this tool will not be applicable or practical. So this is this, uh, the first limitation. The second one, data input in this tool is manual and based on assumptions in most ca cases. So what you are seeing here in pink color, the user has to uh, input the data, all this pink. And most of these inputs that are manual, uh, you input them manually, not based on your design. And the third limitation data is inputted regardless of the configuration of the design of the building. And the fourth, so the user uh, must have uh, expertise in building performance analysis to select the appropriate, assum uh, the appropriate assumption. So using this tool. So as you can see already, we have four limitation using this tool and we want to improve this tool so the idea actually how to integrate BIM to this tool BIT tool to support BI evaluation building energy intensity this is our focus in this paper so what we did actually uh, we developed uh, a workflow for this integration which contains three major components so we are using uh, a BIM model and we developed some visual uh, scripting using a software called Dynamo. 
And so it's like we made this B model as the database to extract all the data that we need and we input it in BIT tool automatically instead of doing this process manually. So this is the uh, workflow, how the two, uh, the, our workflow will work. So first of all, as you can see, we have a BIM model. This BIM model should contain uh, the analytical space assigned in this. So they look green like this in uh, the software Revit. And as you can see, we have module one, which contains uh, the module which can assess the overall thermal transfer value and the uh, roof transfer uh, value of the roof. So this module, because BIT contains many components, one of them is OTV and RITV. And if you if you don't use any tool to calculate this manually, it's really time consuming. So we developed a script to automate that already. And the second module, we are taking advantage of these spaces, analytical spaces in the model to get this information automatically also. So actually the user currently, they are inputting this manually one by one. So here we are generating them automatically to be inputted in BIT. Here are uh, the scripts that uh, we developed regarding the OTV module one. So these are Dynamo scripts. They are not text-based script, they are visual scripting. So for the OTTV, the workflow actually, it starts by the BIM model. The, the first condition, we check if the air conditioned area, there are more than 1000 meters square for the OTTV. This is according to MS1525. And then the script will go to the air conditioned rooms. From the air conditioned rooms, we focus on building elements of the envelope of this con air conditioned rooms because we consider only air conditioned spaces in OTTV calculation. And then we are able to detect the orientation of all the walls and windows of this uh, building envelope elements. And based on that, we start extracting all the data that we need for OTTV until we get the results in Excel. So after that, after doing all the development process, we need to test our workflow on a case study. So this is our case study. So it's a BIM model, so made using Autodesk Revit. And as you can see, it contains spaces. These spaces, they, are, they contain the main, uh, uh, very important variables that we need to extract. Here are the overall configuration of the building in terms of uh, what type of windows, what type of glazing, the U value of windows, if there is shading devices or no, exterior walls, roof, and how many the number for each orientation number of elements <clears throat> so after that when we uh, try to use our tool and test it on the that case study and we compare the results if we use only the the, the bit tool alone instead of how what we developed here so we have notes first of all the results are exactly the same this is not uh, this is normal because uh, because this is static um, we are following a static model for the assessment this means it's like there is an equation and if you put the same variables in the same equation so basically the results they will be the same however the the most the important difference is here here for our case the uh, the process of calculating this is automatic it's not manual this one is manual and it's based on the beam uh, data same thing for the RETV here, as you can see, the results, they are the same, but here, this one is manual and takes time. This one is automatic. So basically it's in few seconds, the scripts will be able to extract the data and give you the results without any uh, human intervention almost. Uh, occupancy load, this one is assumed, unfortunately, in this tool. However, right now using our scripts, actually we can calculate it automatically and accurately based on the design, based on the design that we have, not uh, just assuming like this. And you know, if you are, if you want to uh, assume, basically you need experience. If you don't experience to assume, maybe you will not uh, make good assumption. Similar thing for lighting power and plug load, always they are assumed here, but now we are calculating them based on the design that we have using uh, these scripts that we developed. So in the end, 
we need to, after doing the our calculation in our uh, developed tool, we can um, copy the results to the BIT tool or export the result to the BIT tool to get the results of the BI, building energy intensity. And it's 131 uh, kilowatt hour per meter square per year. Now, regarding the conclusion, so this study investigated the method to support the assessment of building energy intensity, BAI, by integrating the BIM data, visual scripting, and BIT tool together. The results have shown that the proposed BIM BIE system is more advantageous compared to the current method of assessing BAI in terms of automating data extraction and input. And last but not least, Always when we develop uh, any tool or workflow using uh, visual scripting, it's, it, in order to make it user-friendly, it's always suggest to develop the tool as plugin uh, for Revit, for example, which is a, a BIM authoring tool. So, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Yataki. Any question from the audience, please? So if no question from the audience, uh, our research colloquium today will be end here. Uh, for information, we will have a research colloquium every month and all students are encouraged to join us also. So if you are uh, uh, interested to share about your, res uh, your research progress, you may register your title with me or Dr. Song. So and before you leave, please help me to fill up the attendance list. I will send the link to the chat box here. So that's all for today and thanks for attendance. See you on our next colloquium session.